Welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast in association with Charles Tirrett, who will be supporting the podcast in the build-up to the Ashes and across Wisdom's coverage of the series. Often known for their stylish shirts, it's worth checking out their knitwear range, including crewnecks, v-necks and zipnecks, available in a variety of colours and perfect for wearing to the office or even when you're at home. During this period, we'll be offering a discount code for our listeners. If you use the code WISDOM20 at checkout, as the code suggests, you'll get 20% off your order. That's code WISDOM20. We'll provide the URL for that in the description of the pod. Just as we all predicted, Australia are T20 World Cup champions. I'm Yaz Rana, and to talk about the final, the tournament as a whole, the latest developments in the racism scandal that's continuing to engulf the English game, and more are the Wisdom Cricket Monthly duo of Joe Harmon and Phil Walker. Mark Butcher will be joining us over the phone later in the episode. Um, Phil, how do you feel when you hear the words Australia are world champions? Uh, weirdly reassured that the old world order is newly restored. Uh, it... it I wrote this actually last week in the build-up to the final that for people of a certain temperament from a certain part of the of the world of a certain age, and I happen to fill, fall into that demographic, um, it will never be anything other than peculiar and and a blip that England are these kind of one day white ball trailblazers. It never really sits sits right with me. Australia has always been that team in my head, uh, and of course this is the one that they they they've never won. Um, lost or, a couple or particularly of cared about <laughs> right well I think that's the real crux of it and we'll come to that in a minute uh, because there is a kind of slightly inverse slightly kind of ugly satisfaction that I can personally garner from seeing a rather orthodox cricket team that's eschewed some of the funkier and more uh, advanced uh, theorizing or over theorizing around 20 over cricket there's some there's some kind of dark satisfaction that I can just about gain from it from seeing a team that is at best ambivalent about twenty over cricket. Uh, uh, kind of you know throwing all the all the theorists um, a curveball and going ahead and winning the thing. Turns out they're actually a bunch of very good one day cricketers. Yeah, a lot of people have said Australia don't really care, but I'm not sure that's definitely true. Justin Langer built his reputation as a coach. Initially, as, as a very good T20 coach, winning the BBL a few times. It's, it's a cultural coaches. thing, though. Right? I mean, obviously, the coach is going to say that, and the you know the core of the team are going to say that. But culturally, in Australia, Jeff Lemon wrote a good thing on this in in the Guardian um, after the final, and he made this point. Adam Collins has said this as well on their own podcast, but you know, off the record mm. as well that the Australian public have a a standoffish relationship with 20 over cricket, certainly at an international level. Is that any different to the English public? I don't know. You tell me. Well, I, I don't think English fans care as much about T20 World Cups as ODI World Cups and they don't care about ODI World Cups as much as the Ashes. That's a bit of a generalisation, but I think that's broadly But, it, but it's more, for, for me, more it's the, the team that Australia have put out and they lead up to this tournament. Mm. Whereas England, Owen Morgan's England have basically picked their best 11 pretty much every single time they can for like the last three years. Mm. Uh, Australia have barely put their best side out on the park and, and they just turned up were really good and, and won the thing and there mm. is I can see where Phil's coming from if it was anyone but Australia I'd probably probably agree with you <laughs> but it's quite galling to see Australia winning tournaments they didn't even necessarily think they would or could win um, but as I think we're going to come on to Yaz you're suddenly kind of uh, won over by Australia right? Oh, it's not suddenly it's not suddenly I, I've weirdly liked David Warner for a very long time I think a lot of the Australian side is just very likable. Uh, Marcus I, I don't dispute that. I in said particular, this last week. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's, he's admirably open. Obviously, very emotionally intelligent. Uh, Adam Zampa too. Glenn Maxwell seems like a nice guy. It's quite hard oh, not to, to back. Him. I, I totally agree. The, the shit blokes, good blokes thing that you know permeates in cricket. I mean, a little bit of analysis probably blows that thing out of the water quite quickly. <laughs> uh, yeah, and also we see a fraction of their personalities, mm. obviously. But I did listen to Mitch Marsh on the Great Cricketer. And he just sounded like a really nice bloke, very self-deprecating. Uh, he was laughing about the Max- Maxwell had said that he was hitting the ball better than any player he'd ever seen, <laughs> or possibly in the history of the game. <laughs> and Mitch Marsh was just like, "Yeah, you, you don't really need that, do you? You don't need that at all." As it turned out, uh, he was pitting them pretty well, <laughs> hitting yeah. them pretty well yesterday. And uh, yeah, I certainly wouldn't wouldn't begrudge him what happened yesterday. I think he's one of those cricketers that's always perhaps because the name he carries, but he's always. People have been quite quick to stick the boot in, and I understand this is particularly true in Australia over the years as well. But 
he had a brilliant tournament and he's had a brilliant year in T20 cricket. It was actually no real surprise that he came good and that he was kind of Australia's form player going into the tournament and, and just kept it going. He, he was the one big positive when they kept losing T20. So he'd never scored a T20 half cent, T20 I half century before this year. He scored six in, in 2021, including the one in the final. Um, and in those series where they did very badly against Bangladesh and West Indies, he he batted three when there was no one else there but he's from the first team. He does well and he stays in the side. And then that's when they shove way down the order um, to number seven. Um, a lot of the pre-match build-up in the UK, at least, was was about this being an unlikely final. And in some ways, I do get that. Um, the story of Wade not having batted at seven for five years or whatever, Marsh's uh, resurgence. And uh, D- Daryl Mitchell, have you, have you heard this? So Daryl Mitchell only opened the batting in the World Cup for New Zealand because Seafoot was quarantine- quarantining before the tournament. So Mitchell does it for the first time in the warm-up games, does well, and they're like... Do you want to keep doing it? Oh, I didn't realise um, that's what led to it. I knew yeah. he hadn't done it before the tournament, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I get that there are individual guys that, that haven't played that much T20i cricket over the last few years. But when I look at Australian side, I, I think they are probably the, the third or fourth best side on paper in that tournament. Well, well I, I, I had them in the semi-finals. Yeah. I, did, I had England and them in the semi-finals from that group for what it was worth because I just didn't understand the West Indies hype when they were all aching and old and... The, the vibe just didn't seem right around the West Indies. I didn't think Australia were going to go and win it. Uh, but yeah, th- th- there's always that reservoir of quality there. Of course there is. And it's interesting as well, I guess, that they picked and played in every game their three test match seamers. Okay, you know, Zampa is the Lion equivalent. Um, but they, they went in there with their three best bowlers. Their three best bowlers, I guess, in any kind of form of cricket and... And that's worked for them and played out in the end. Mm. Hazelwood was very good, wasn't he? Yeah, but as a, I mean, he was brilliant yesterday. I mean, Mitch Marsh probably on balance just about deserved player of the match, but Hazelwood was right up there with three for 16 of his four. Um, I guess it's, as it, from an England-centric point of view, it's hard not for your kind of mind not to drift back to that absolute thrashing dished out only a couple of weeks ago and think, how has the team that lost like that gone on to to win the tournament? And particularly given that they haven't really been a side that have played much together, it, it does seem odd that they pulled it together. But then it, it also, in another way, doesn't seem odd because this is Australia and they do win world tournaments, even if they hadn't won this one previously. It, quite quite a lot of the Australia side from yesterday were part of the 2015 World Cup. It's, it's just a very old squad. Uh, yeah. the, the youngest player who played the finals, Pat Cummins, 28. Really? Yeah. And, and talking about Langer earlier, I mean, I, I don't really subscribe to the idea that this, this has any impact on the Ashes whatsoever, really apart from the fact that it does make Langer's life a lot easier. I mean, it, it, we, we were only we were kind of mocking him for his LinkedIn profile and all that kind of stuff. And, that, and now he's won a world tournament with Australia. He'll probably go on and win the Ashes. And if they do call it a day, then he's he's had a really good reign as Australia's coach, hasn't he? Which mm. was not how it felt uh, yeah, just a couple of weeks ago. Mm. Um, anyway, here are Butcher's thoughts on the final and the tournament as a whole. Australia are world champions. Uh, I don't think anyone predicted that at the start of the tournament. They won... Uh, the final fairly emphatically at the end. But what did you make of that performance from Mitch Marsh in particular, newly established at number three, he's been playing for Australia for a decade. He never scored yeah. a T20 I half century before this tournament and now he's played the match in a World Cup final. No, and he is, um, he's one of those guys that kind of, the, 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 the Australian cricket in public tends not to have any any sort of respect for at all. You know, sort of all, all muscles and no brain apparently and is always injured and, you know, the, the Marsh family tends to cop it anyway. You know, Sean was the sort of like the, the, the bloke that would come in every time there was a crisis. He'd make a duck and disappear again then make a load of runs in the shield. So the Marshes are the family that the Aussies love to hate. Um, and he's basically, he's basically put in a performance that's a microcosm of Australia's win, really. Um, you know, somebody that, that lots of people don't rate. Nobody, nobody gave it a chance of doing anything particularly special. Um, has, has played an absolute blinder in the final and the green and gold have won the tournament. I mean, everybody said they were going to win from the start, right? All, the, all of the boys on the, all of the boys on the stats and all that kind of stuff worked oh, it you, all out. You, last, time every, spoke, every, last time I spoke to you, you said Shane Watson was their player of the tournament so far. Right, wait, <laughs> he had been. And I, th- I still think he's got half a, half, a, half a shout of getting the title, but um, it's looking pretty ominous, isn't it? That uh, Josh Hazelwood is a monster. I mean, you know, there was there was a time in the not so uh, dim and distant past where 
his sort of white ball credentials were were, were 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 way behind those of his red ball. But he's now he's now frighteningly good at both. Um, that really doesn't bode well for, for for what's to come for the for the lads who are going to be sharing a party plane um, from Dubai over to Australia probably for England. Um, he, he's extraordinary. Mitch Marsh has played by that. Warner seems to have found some form again. I think maybe it's you know the smell of the, the sniff of, of English bowlers on Australian pitches with Kookaburras that's kind of woken him up because he started to started to look at the business again. Um, and, and Australia doing what they doing what they do in tournaments really. I mean, it was kind of what, what you expect from them in fifty over cricket, whereby they might not be any great shakes going into it, but turn up and end up winning it. They've done the same in a format whereby most people thought they were hopeless, had no idea what they were doing. But um, Justin Langer and his several wins, multiple wins as, as a Perth Scorchers coach has, has pulled one out of the bag again. Mm. If, if you had to endure a 18-hour flight with Australia having just won a World Cup at some point in the <laughs> 2000s, how, how, do you got, how do you got through it? <laughs> Well, the same way they did, probably. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's, there's too many other ways of going about it. If you, if you can't beat them, join them, that is for yeah. sure. Um, what were your overall impressions of the tournament? It was quite strange. Two unlikely finalists. There were some standout games. The semi-finals were very good. Pakistan India was mm. big. But other than that, there were a lot of um, not particularly close finishes. Um, and also, mm. there, there seemed to be a pattern to a lot of the games. The team would crawl up to one between 140 to 160. And the team changing yeah. it would generally win with an over to spare. Uh, I feel I feel like that given the format's popularity around the world, it still doesn't feel the same level as a fifty over World Cup. It could be down to the location of the tournament, the proximity to the IPL. But what are your overall impressions of of the tournament? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've I've, I've sort of long been of the opinion that sort of the the, the franchises or the sort of the club tournaments do it better than the than the international ones in T Twenty. And, and therefore, I'm quite sort of happy to leave it to them and not, and, and, you know, and not trouble the international teams with it too much, to be honest. Um, you know, TV money and, and whatever. And, and also the, the chance for um, smaller cricketing nations to sort of to, to play on the bigger stage means that that's, that's just not possible, you know, and, and, and I should shut up and never, never mention it again. But that's part of the reason why, part of the reason why it always feels a little bit anticlimactic. Um, however, there, there were lots of other circumstances, I think, that, that gave it that problem this year. Um, yeah, just simply, sim- obviously, the UAE, very difficult. It's quite sterile anyway, no matter who plays there, no matter what the tournament. It, it's all, you're always playing there because you, because you want to be playing somewhere else. So that gives you a, an issue in the first place. Then when you don't have the sort of the natural sort of you're moving around the country or you're, you're playing at different stadiums, you know, you've got the exactly you know, the same stadium, the pitch reports as well. It's the same as one we played on yesterday. and All of the stats start to sort of, you know, back up, win the toss, uh, win the game type thing. It, it, gives you, it gives you a real problem in terms of the spontaneity that, that sport requires. Um, and so, you know, it's not, that's not particularly the, the, the fault of the format. It's the fault of... Um, the world and COVID and, and various other things, meaning that the, the competition had to be played in a place where, you know, where you didn't have the natural, um, the natural moving around a, a country, the, the natural support that you'd have had if you'd have played in India, um, and the colour and the vibrancy that it brings playing in a in a host country that is not the UAE. So um, there wasn't a great deal they could do about that. Um, what do you do about the thing about the toss? I mean, that's the the biggest talking point. Yeah, um, so a lot of the chat around the final was about the toss. So 12 out yeah. of 13 Dubai games were won by the chasing side. The only yeah. one that wasn't was when New Zealand beat Scotland by 16 runs. So yeah, yeah. it's the uh, second T20 World Cup in a row where the champions only won games <laughs> in chasing. And only one yeah. side, England in 2010, has won a T20 World Cup, having won fewer than half the tosses. So two questions, I guess. Why, yeah. is, it, why is it seemingly the case that chasing is so much easier in night games in that part of the world at least and Mm. then two do you think it's something that that needs serious consideration well yeah it does i I think it does i think you know any anywhere in the world whereby you get a you get a a marked change in the um, in the conditions of the sport and i'm not talking about you know obviously if you tee off in golf in the morning it's bright sunshine and no wind and by the afternoon it could be you know peeing it down and and blowing a gale, that happens, you know, changes in conditions happen, it happens in Formula One, it happens all over the place. 
But when you have a uniform change, just which is simply by dint of the fact that the sun goes down um, and the lights get switched on and you know that that change is coming and you can kind of, you know, you can legislate for it in terms of knowing what will happen. What you can't legislate for is who wins the coin toss. Um, what do you do in those circumstances? I mean, you know, I've heard um, suggestions that the, uh, the, the team that loses the toss and ends up having to, having to bat first can sort of try and negotiate between 10 and 20 runs, you know, or, you know whatever it is, head start, so that it goes on at the end. I mean, it's all, it's all very silly. I mean, the, the only thing you can really do in order to try and make it the same for both teams is to stick a roof on these places. Um, and if there's anywhere in the world that, that might have the money to be able to do something like that, it might be the UAE. Um, you know, the, the, I think as far as I as far as I can see, the only way that you can make it so that it's even for both teams, and even because because what then happens is even on the days where there might not be a great deal of dew, second time round, the the perception or the sort of like the, the psyche of, of both teams is that there is a massive advantage chasing, that there is a, a, an issue scoring runs batting first, and so almost psychologically it becomes um, you know self fulfilling. So. It's very, very difficult. And, and of course, again, I use the word spontaneity. It kind of, the crowd immediately assumes, as soon as the toss goes up, that whoever wins it is going to win the game. And that's, that's not good for a sporting contest. So, is, so can you explain why they do make such a big difference? Is it that the bowlers can't grip the ball better or is the pitch, is, it, is the speed of the pitch change and does batting just become easier? Yeah, what, what happens is, is that the pitch is... You know, you've got bright, burning sunshine, um, sort of that's that's been on on the ground um, through the course of most of the day. The pitches t- tend to be a tiny bit tacky as they start with a brand new ball later on in the afternoon. If you think think about um, think about what happens normally if you're playing a test match, right, or you're playing a, a fifty over game that perhaps starts at, let's say, for example, eleven o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. Start at eleven o'clock in the afternoon. It might just do a little bit for the for the um, for the scene bowlers in the morning in the first innings. It might, but then you know, generally after that, it turns out to be quite flat, and it might turn towards the eggs. It's burning hot sun. It's been down on the pitch all day. You get a bit of turn. There's rough patches on the on the ground, um, and you know, and as a, as a consequence of that, batting later on in the in the second innings, it becomes slightly more tricky as the ball gets softer. But what happens in, in the day-night games is you start off in the, in the evening, um, you know, after, uh, sort of the heat of the day has gone through and whatever. You get that sort of sticky patch with the, when the ball is new. So the scene grips on that pitch where it is a little bit, little bit powdery maybe and the ball just grips a little. You don't get off to a great start. You perhaps lose two or three wickets in the power play. And, and we all know, you know, that this is one where, one where the stats generally gets it right. If you lose three, three wickets or more in the power play, you're kind of toast in, in a game. Um, and then, you know, and then knowing what, what target to set becomes very difficult. Then what happens is, and this happens virtually every single time, you get to a certain time of the evening, the dew comes down, it kind of, it, it makes, it just makes the ball kind of skid through onto the bat. It then poses the fielding team with the, with the slight issue that the ball becomes a little bit slippy and, and wet for the spinners to grip. They can't grip it in their hand and the seam doesn't grip on the pitch. Um, and therefore you end up with conditions that are markedly different from the ones that happen. Um, in the first half of the match, and and the problem, the problem, the, the massive problem is, is it happens every single time. So you can count on it. You know it's you know it's coming. You know it's going to happen. And the team batting first tries to legislate for it. And what do they do? I think we've seen in the tournament that they try to kind of go to the first for the first ten overs. They've actually tried to be relatively risk free and then try to make it up in the back end. But in doing so, only post you know totals of around one fifty, one sixty, which given the change in the conditions. 190 would be par if you if you were batting first starting at sort of the seven seven o'clock in the evening for example so you're just miles behind mm-hmm. um, and there's you know bar, so stopping barring um, you know like I said putting a roof on the ground or playing the matches in the in the burning heat of the day starting at ten o'clock in the morning I don't really see what you can do about it. Mm. Um, you mentioned the the stats getting one right uh, just just finally I wanted to go on and get your impressions of the way in which this tournament was covered compared to other ones is the first team mm. to work up in five and a half years. And stats, I guess, uh, played a very prominent part of the TV broadcast coverage in a way they wouldn't have done mm. in the previous T20 World Cups. Um, do you think it's possibly gone too far that way? And then 
that actually we should embrace the volatility of T20 cricket. Uh, and actually, there's almost been a push to make it more like an American sport in terms of coverage, all the data, uh, when yeah. actually the, the charm of a T20 World Cup could be that it's a volatile format, that you can't really predict what goes on all the time, and you could get unlikely winners like you have this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, as, as has been evidenced, really. Um, it's, it's a tricky one. Um, you know, for, for, for broadcasters, put it this way. If you're if you're commentating and um, you know you you're commentating on teams, perhaps you don't see a massive amount of, um, you know your 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 professional career has you in one part of the world and, and they come for another one. It's always very handy to be able to have you know sheets and, and stats and things at your fingertips in order to try and give yourself an, an impression as to how um potentially players that you've not seen a great deal of might play or how teams might go. And, you know, and that's and that's generally across the board. However, when the entire sort of basis around your sort of your the speech and your and your thinking around what might transpire in the game is based upon things like matchups, um, you know, if the ball is bowled at this length, it tends to go for this many runs, et cetera, et cetera. It's, I mean, it's all, it's, it's all great stuff. You know, it's all kind of like, it's all very clever, but it kind of doesn't really mean anything. Um, it, it means nothing when a hip high full toss, um, you know, can, can, is just as likely to take you a wicket as a ball that pitches, pitches on off stump and, and, and nips, nips back to hit the top of leg or something. You know, the, 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 the sport kind of doesn't necessarily reward being excellent and being um, being consistent in that way, so you know I think it's very much it's very much the job of the, the commentators to kind of to try and to try and steer their way through those rocky waters. You know, you kind of you, you can lean on things. Sometimes they throw out incredible stats. You know, things that are, that make everybody's um, eyes wider, and, and you think, wow, that was that was kind of interesting. Ninety um, percent of the time, they don't. <laughs> I, I look. I look forward to your next stint in a in a T Twenty commentary box. Yeah, I'm gonna get. I'll get nailed if I if I meant even so much as mention a single number. I'm gonna get crucified. Um, Joe, on the game itself, it felt like it followed the pattern of quite a lot of games at the tournament. Reasonably restrained start by the side batting first, who obviously lost the toss. Uh, acceleration in the final ten, and then the chasing side then wins with a over or so to spare. But that summary doesn't quite do justice to Kane Williamson's innings which was 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 pretty special what a knock and it's one of it's one of the unfair things about cricket or sport in general that innings will never get the credit it deserves because New Zealand didn't go on to win the game but but given what had come before in those early overs where Gupsil just could barely get the ball off the square Williamson was I think 17 off 17 before he kind of exploded into yeah, life like seven or 13 before that as well yeah and just that just played so beautifully as well I mean there were some classic shots in amongst I mean, it's not brute power, is it? It's just it's just timing. There's the one clip, clip off his legs that went for six. It looked like he'd kind of barely put anything into it at all. Mm. Um, but the, the the start that New Zealand made was odd. It it was odd. I'd, it looked like they were kind of thinking this is like a 150 pitch. Um, and at one stage, it didn't look like we were even going to get that. I don't know if Guptill just got stuck. It, but to me, it looked like there was a bit of a lack of intent. It kind of did remind me slightly of the way that England are batted against New Zealand, where... You know, in the end, they get a decent score that on another day could have won them the game. But you're still thinking there was maybe like a kind of a, a 5% of, of intent missing there that could have got them to a score that would be harder to chase down. And then to, to have your finisher, how many balls did Nishan face? Was it seven, I think? Yeah, something uh, like that. Basically, yeah. And over and a bit at the end to have your your key man, really. I mean, you know, in a, in a properly evolved T20 side, he's your player that you ensure has at least four or five overs at the end. Um, and so, yeah, look, the pattern would, was made at Dubai before that final, as we know. It's 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 the 10 from 10, right? 10 from 10, 10, 10 tosses, 10 results going the, the way of the toss, going the way of teams batting second. So uh, you had to go for broke, right? You had to. You had to be prepared to be bundled out for 130, 140 in order to get up to 180, you would have thought. And that's what I thought they were doing at the start when Mitchell took on uh, Maxwell's first ball hits in the six. I thought like they just like, properly identified if we're going to, if we're batting first, we need to score 20 runs more than what we think par is. And if we don't get it, that's fine. Cause we're probably going to lose anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it was, it was odd. I guess, I guess the difficulty with, with Nisham at f five or six is that 
Santa at seven is, is probably one position too high, but that's the balance of the side that New Zealand have gone for. So I guess they wanted to... And, and Conway was a big loss. I mean, I think Conway's yeah. importance, the importance of his knock against England kind of got lost a bit because of what Nisham and what Mitchell went on to do. But he really kept them just about in the game, even if it didn't necessarily feel like that at the time. And, mm. and to lose him... Uh, and then have Seifert coming in for his, I think, for his first game of the tournament. I think second, second game of the early, tournament. Yeah. That was a, that's a big drop off for a for a World Cup final. And and Glenn Phillips, who came in, what really should be should have been the prime moment for him, just didn't really get going. I think there's a, a feeling with him that he's very very destructive against kind of mediocre bowling and quite small grounds, but he hasn't really shown it against top quality attacks. And he just got a bit stuck again yesterday at exactly the time when they needed to keep going. The Usman Kawaja of the New Zealand T20 high side. Um, I'm just going through here. 57 runs from combined Guptill, Mitchell and Phillips. And Nisham comes in with two and a half overs to go. So, okay, Williamson is playing out of his boots at one end and, and doing both roles, anchoring and attacking. But to garner 57 seven bits from the best part of, well, 85% of the innings and then leaving your biggest hitter and your your form man, who would have obviously been feeling ten foot tall going in the game, yeah. You know, sometimes these things don't work. Sometimes, you know, a player is trying desperately to 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 open up or to get out, and they can't. Sometimes that's just how how T Twenty cricket plays out. You know, there are these these immense variables that play out on the day that are unavoidable. It's part of what makes it so interesting, for sure. And going back to your original question about Australia, there is something quite. Um, edifying about a team that wasn't especially fancied has its own way of doing things and and getting on that run and it's and it brings a kind of unpredictability to it which is you know it's a positive thing there's no reason why the best team has to win a knockout tournament we've seen it throughout sporting history and that's one of the reasons why we keep tuning in Hmm. I, i think what we saw yesterday we can talk about kind of intent and mindset and stuff i think i think new zealand's limitations that a lot of us had foreseen at the start of the tournament which hadn't necessarily held them back kind of showed up yesterday you look through that side and I mean how, how many players had a good game uh, Williamson obviously Bolt, Bolt was, was exceptional really no one else played well quite a few players played poorly hmm. um, their spinners I, we talked before the England New Zealand game would England go after New Zealand spinners in a way that other sides hadn't well Australia did yesterday Sodi was completely I mean sort of effectively knocked out of the attack was kind of throwing down wides by the end um, looked a bit a bit broken and I think and also when it comes to New Zealand's batting I think part of the reason they played like that is because they don't really have the players I mean it, no one would have thought that Mitchell was going to pull off the knock that he did against England to get them over the line that's not to say they got lucky that a player did a brilliant thing on, on the day but I don't think New Zealand have got the side to consistently pull off performances against top T20 sides yeah so how do you think New Zealand will be feeling about their, their tournament and that's a third white ball final lost in six years second to Australia but I feel it's very different to 2015 and 2019 Phil you made the point in last week's show that when they got to the 2015 World Cup final they were the team of the tournament whereas this time it kind of felt that they, they probably aren't in the top four T20 sides in the world so is it kind of a missed opportunity in that way then well, it's obviously literally a missed opportunity in that they lost the final, mm. but I don't think this one is kind of full of regret. They could have done it any differently. I think they got definitely beaten by a much better side on the day and probably just a better side overall, really. Um, and, you know, that England win in itself is is special. Uh, probably, oh, well, I was going to say, the match of the tournament, I suppose Australia-Pakistan might might rival it for that. Um, although there weren't necessarily that many to, to pick from as one of our... We'll get Listeners to that in a bit, yeah. alluded to. Um, I, I do feel for them, you mentioned Ish Sodi, three overs for 40-odd, having been one of the players of the tournament. That's that's a brutal turn of events on the night. Tim Southie went the distance, and you feel like him as a cricketer is of a different kind of era. Lockie Ferguson didn't make the... Sorry, was injured, and obviously Adam Mill came in to replace him. And it might have been a, simply a like for like and that Southie would have been locked in to open the bowling anyway. But you, you wonder if maybe with that one extra quick, you know, Lockie, Lockie Ferguson, one of the quickest bowlers in the world and an IPL stalwart now. So, yeah, that might have given them a bit more edge. It felt like a procession when Australia were, you know, and I was glued to it and it felt like a procession watching them get to get to their target. Yeah, it's one of those things. I think Joe's right. I don't think I don't think New Zealand really went into this tournament thinking that they were the, they were going to take it. Will McLean asks, 
I need convincing that knockout competitions and cricket are a good mix. There are too many contingent factors that influence the result of a standalone game to make it meaningful. Or am I being grumpy because I think if England played Australia in T20 cricket 10 times, England would, would win at least seven. Joe? Um, but isn't that kind of the beauty of knockout cricket, I would say? Maybe, maybe it's being grumpy. Need more. Yeah, well, I mean, there was yeah, the group stage was too long. It would have been nice to have quarterfinals and semifinals. I mean, for me personally, and some of my friends have disagreed with me on this, they, they've really enjoyed the tournament from the start. But for me personally, I thought it only really came alive at the semifinals. There were, there were moments, of course, even going back what feels like months ago when Scotland beat Bangladesh. And obviously there were those, and Butler's century was fantastic to watch. But in terms of an actual contest being brought to life, I only really felt that when we hit the semifinal stage. So yeah, I'd have loved to see more knockout cricket obviously there is the toss is is an issue and I've I think I've probably ducked this one because I just don't want to think about it too much because it's not nice to think that the game you're watching is so heavily dictated by something that happens before the game starts but it is an issue it, it's an issue obviously in t20 anyway sides just like to chase then when you throw the conditions on top of that it just felt like my obviously I was supporting New Zealand yesterday and my heart really sunk at the result of the toss yesterday and that it shouldn't really be the way um, how we Aaron, fixed Aaron it Finch afterwards basically saying you know I won six from seven I don't know how I did that but you know that that's my biggest contribution to the tournament oh, did he say? Yeah. Won uh, six tosses from seven, yeah. and he was saying that during the tournament he didn't want to say that because he knew there was a possibility that they might have to bat first sure sure yeah um, I didn't but, realize but, it said that. Now, that's funny. It's, it's a massive problem it's, it's inescapable you know, you, you go into a test series kind of expecting the best team to win for sure. But the beauty of 20 over cricket is that there is there is a greater kind of balancing off of talent. And we've seen it. And that's a good thing overall. But when so much of it is skewed to something that hasn't that, that's playing out before a ball is bowled, that is really that is problematic. And it might be unique to the conditions that they encountered in the UAE, or it might be that teams are becoming more and more uh, advanced, more and more sophisticated in how to structure a chase. And that I know that the numbers are skewed historically, but not dramatically so. Um, it would be interesting to see, say, in Australia on truer pitches where um, you're not going to have those kinds of, you know, overhead conditions, if you like, in, of an evening affecting the game too much. Um, although Jew does still play a part in Australia in the, in the day-night test matches and so on. So be fascinating to see if this is a trend and if it is and if teams who are batting second are winning 60 percent of the time uh, and that be that plays out as a as a long-term trend then i think cricket in this particular format which is famed for its versatility and its progressiveness i think they have to get funky i really do i think um you have to start opening up genuinely interesting and radical ideas such as selling the toss for example how much is a toss worth is it worth 20, 20 runs? Is it worth 25 runs? Um, possibly splitting it into into four innings of 10. Um, that would be another possibility. I know that these kinds of ideas have been have kicked around the, the, the lower reaches of the internet and so on. But um, as things stand, I think we're fine. But if the tournament next year is skewed to the same extent percentage-wise that this one is, then they absolutely have to address it for sure. What do you think? Yeah, as I say, I've kind of ducked it, but increasingly it's becoming hard hard to avoid. Yeah, when, when punters are building to a World Cup and already your heart's sunk, as you say, before a ball's bowled, you know, that's problematic for a, for a showpiece where it should be, all things being Yeah, and, and it's possibly, obviously it was particularly dramatic at this tournament, so 12 out of the 13 games at Dubai were won by the chasing side. The only game where it wasn't was when New Zealand beat Scotland by only 16 runs, and... Um, this is the second tournament in a row where the champions have only won matches in which they have chased. And England in 2010 are the only team to have won a T20 World Cup, men's T20 World Cup, um, having lost more than half the tosses. So right. it goes back to the, the beginning, basically. The toss obviously is an advantage, but it is possibly too much. I, I do think I'm broadly fine with keeping it exactly the same as it is. But I think in certain parts of the world where... Um, 
trends are more extreme, then I think you, ha- you have to do something about it. But otherwise, yeah, what you said, you can't feel like a significant part of the game is over before the game starts. That's just, that's just not why people watch it. And this is what some of my friends who don't really watch cricket that much, what they, they had picked up that, that was a key point. And that's that's not a very enticing way to bring someone to a sport that a cost, the toss of a coin is, you know, swinging, swinging game and one side's favour that dramatically. Um Oase asks, why are we so reluctant to admit that this tournament, in all honesty, has been a bit rubbish? Are we? Uh, I, I, thought, think, I thought we got told thought, off for doing exactly that, didn't we, last week? Yeah, but I, I guess other people have been more positive about it than, than, than we have. Um, I, it's, I just it's, think it's, until it's the always, semi... Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I was just saying, until the semi-finals, it, it just didn't feel like a World Cup at all. Uh, and, I, and I think part of that is... Uh, a big tournament needs like a, a three week run where nothing happens and load is made out of each piece of minor news. So like for a football major tournament, you have three, four weeks and you you know, they're, they're covering, you know, what food are England having in the camp and that kind of thing. Yeah. You get really invested in it. There's also, I mean, it's a bit of a soft, I'm not making excuses because I've, I've struggled as you know, um, to really engage with this tournament. Um, but, the, the COVID thing undoubtedly plays its part because what you what's removed are the the fans that are reflections of the players, and then the players and that particular team become they they develop their own identity within the context of a tournament. And you saw it say with Ireland, for example, in in the World Cup, you know, way back when, where uh, the players are an extension of the people who have got who have spent their money and gone to watch them. But what you had this time round was like the players' families and the odd dignitary. And one or two kind of Dubai-based businessmen, expats, and so on. And so there was, apart from one or two, you know, the big game, obviously, the India-Pakistan game. But if you're looking further afield, there wasn't really that sense of a, of a kind of festival of cricket. Even which... that, the England-New Zealand semi, oh, exactly. for, the, for the first 10 minutes, before <laughs> it was before the Sri Lankan like, band, band got yeah. going. I was like, oh, thank God. Because before then, all you could hear was t- two English blokes basically shouting across the field at each other. Yeah. Which that can't be a World Cup semi-final in any sport and like cricket's got some kind of <laughs> reputation bias to get over anyway and that is that is not uh, helping and that, that undoubtedly has a huge effect particularly if you're a punter turning on yeah. and you want to be told that this is a massive thing and it matters to so many people well it's hard to get that sense when when there are not very many people in the ground and a lot of them don't care that much yeah i i, I couldn't shake the um like this sort of weariness this sort of sense of inertia when you turn your telly on and it's the same group of commentators commentating on the same group of players just in different kits. And sure, it's amplified because they're playing for their countries. But the week before that, they were playing against each other just in another domestic competition. And it just felt like it was the same vibe, the same show repackaged for another week. Uh, and I... You know, I struggle with with the notion anyway of kind of allegiance. I'm, you know, I've been following cricket for forty odd years now. You know, so I I find it hard to really, really get the juices flowing for winners and losers, even even when you're playing in a world tournament. But this one in particular, as again with the absence of fans, felt felt flat in that regard. There was an absence of kind of emotional jeopardy. I found. Did you think that part in part because it followed the IPL almost immediately, played at basically the same venues. Yeah. And even that so. second part of the IPL felt fl- quite flat because obviously it shouldn't have been happening. That was only because the first leg got cancelled. Yeah. I think that's part... I mean, you don't even look at the Indian side were flat. Yeah. It, it just it felt like the kind of the fatigue World Cup yeah. in, in I, some I, senses. I, indeed. I would also add, um, and I'm not trying to cover my back here, but there were some great, great moments, great individual moments within it, you know, and and... You pick any at any number. Williamson's knock yesterday is a minor masterpiece. What Babar Azam did more often than not through through the tournament, Mo Rizwan getting off his hospital bed that morning and coming out and smashing 60-odd in the semi-final. There were certain things that England did that were marvellous. You know, New Zealand's outfielding throughout the tournament. There's some astonishing athletes out there. So um, within within a tournament that, fail to really grab me there are still things that will stick in my mind for sure and those little subtexts those player-based stories those sub sub narratives within it they they still get me going for sure they still stick with me mm. I, I feel though that 
You're, you're just always going to get that when you have really good cricketers, though. Like that, that's the absolute base. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. That's the absolute for base sure. of what you expect from a, yeah, a World Cup. For sure. There weren't, um, yeah, there just weren't enough games that went into the last over with the game stood up for grabs. And that yeah. is obviously when T20 is at its best. And a lot of T20 is watching a game, hoping that you'll get to that point, and then it being a bit disappointing at the end because it hasn't got there. But you've still seen enough good cricket for it to be an enjoyable experience. And that's the situation I think we found ourselves in a lot that, you know, we'd seen some brilliant players doing some brilliant things, but come the final, sorry, or the final throws of the game, often there wasn't enough mm. jeopardy. Uh, Simon <laughs> Simon Chowdhury has asked us to pick our teams of tournament. I've, I've picked mine. Uh, I've, I've left out Baba, uh, Warner and Butler up top, Asalanka three, Markram. And I wasn't sure between Marsh, Moeen or Livingston. It was like a batting all rounder. Uh, Asif Ali, um, and I only face about ten balls in the tournament, but you have most of them six. Um, <laughs> Dwayne, well, you, you've dropped Baba so already, you know, it's a waste of, waste of time. This. Oh season. no, but Jen, isn't Baba played one genuinely excellent knock? He looked amazing, but other than the half century against India, he hit nine off eleven against New Zealand, fifty one off forty seven in a in a chase against Afghanistan that made it pretty difficult for Pakistan towards the end, thirty nine off thirty four against Australia in a high scoring semi final, and lots of runs against Scotland, Namibia, not scored that quickly. Is All that right. is it was was that better than Warner or Butler? No, Definitely no. no, but better than Markram. But He's a good but, player who I like. But but Baba was opening. Right, we'll put Baba at four. No, no, I'm, I'm doing this properly. I'm not gonna not doing gonna fudge it. Properly. Um, Dwayne 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 Pretorius at seven. Hasaranga, uh, eight. Shaheen Zampa, and then either Norkia or Bolt. I wasn't quite sure. Um, <laughs> uh, I think you've got to have Bolt in there. I mean, Bolt was yeah. brilliant yesterday. But Norkia was amazing as well. I guess. I think the, obviously if get, a side gets to the final you've got a huge advantage in the mm. same way that I think you've got to have Marsh in there really when, yeah. when the bloke wins the final for his side yeah that, that's fair enough who's at three? Uh, Markham mm. As, no Asalanka 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 yeah. he, he was great fun yeah did Hasaranga make the cut? yeah he's at five uh, no he's at eight <laughs> five yeah. solid yeah but I thought you were putting players where they, where they batted he did bat as low as eight sure <laughs> okay Fine. Any other? Say, well, Shaheen <laughs> and ten others for me. Yeah. Even though he he, kind of he did make the, the I, got he did make the ICC the tournament. The team in the tournament. Did he not? No official well, ICC yeah, I'm sure team that tournament. Went down well Baba got in. Bad. Baba got in. Baba captain, of course. Um, moving moving on past the the World Cup, I feel like related to our discussion on the build up to the T Twenty World Cup. Um, I basically feel like other than the Ashes, no tournament or big series gets the build up it really deserves. So. This week, New Zealand started a tour to India and Pakistan started a tour to Bangladesh, which is just ridiculous. New Zealand were in the World Cup final yesterday. And then New Zealand and India then have a two test series that takes place, that starts next week, that is genuinely huge. It's the number one versus number two in the world. Um, there's a real chance of New Zealand achieving something seismic. They could end up winning in England, in India and being crowned World Test Champions in the space of eight months. Um, but there's no time to really get invested into what is a massive series. And that's just as a viewer. I think, like, how can we expect the players to adequately prep for these tours? And the schedule has already robbed us of the participation of Bumrah, Shami, Pant, Rohit, Bolt, De Grandhome, and Kohli for the first test. Kohli's coming back for the second test. Um, we're just at a point now, what, what's the point? What's the point in having a series between one and two in the world if you don't get to see seven or eight of their players? Yeah, and this, this should obviously be the, the replay of the World Test Championship final, which should be... It should be a big event and uh, a lot of cricket fans won't even know it's happening. Mm. And when they see who's playing, might not necessarily want to tune in as well. I noticed the Pakistan tour of Bangladesh starts with three T20 internationals mm. as well. Why, why are they doing that? Well, say with India, New Zealand, it's three T20s that start, I think, uh, not tomorrow, on, on Wednesday. There is no reason to play a T20 international now. Money. Well, yeah, I mean, that be, there is that reason, I suppose. <laughs> Everyone's brassic. <laughs> Um, uh, back back in the twenties in New York, um, this kind of craze uh, called dance marathons took place, and it sprang up in various parts of New York. And local couples would go and enter, and they would generally be hand to mouth folk who didn't have much money, and they would enter and they would dance until they dropped, or if they were lucky, they until they were standing, like a kind of early Squid Games, right? Of the twenties, um, people would dance for for. Hours, days, literally, they would be asleep on each other's shoulders. Uh, and the ones who won, when the clock fi finally finally hit, after 60-odd hours or whatever, they would win. And they would win some money and they'd be, be able to eat that week during the Depression and so on. 
this is how it feels to me. It feels like these cricketers are now just basically asleep on each other's shoulders, being churned out, rolled out to the next one. Here's another dance marathon. Here's another marathon. Come on, keep going. Just do you feel keep like dancing? Do you feel like you're dancing yourself as well? Well, I'm, I'm slumped on a Monday <laughs> afternoon. You know, <laughs> we're one of those couples propping each other up. That was the... <laughs> Never a truer word, Joey. Um, oh, that's quite a, qu- a cute image. <laughs> but 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 genuinely, I I just I'm t- almost annoyed at how little build up this series is going to get. This this should be absolutely huge. It's literally one versus two in the world, and the players aren't going to get. Uh, there's no first class cricket at all before before that series for both sides. How can New Zealand be expected to reasonably perform against India, who are so dominant at home, but after playing just three T twenties? Um, what 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 can we do? <laughs> Not very much, I don't think. I don't think it's really within our power. Yeah. But yeah, I suppose. And and the, the, the all, in all likelihood, uh, New Zealand will get absolutely blown away, and it will be a bit of a non-event of a a series. Which you know maybe that would have happened even if things were more in their favour. Yeah. Sorry, how many players? How many of the big players will not be playing in that first Test match? Uh, Shami, Bumra, Rohit, Pant, Kohli, Bolt, DeGrandome. So six of India's first I eleven. Fa- fa- five. Five I think. of India's yeah. first eleven. And only Kohli's coming back for the second test. Wow. Not that he's necessarily the biggest loss, but why is DeGrandome not playing? Uh, bubble fatigue. So oh, right. Bolt and DeGrandome both. Because he wasn't in the fatigue. T20 World Cup squad, was yeah. he? Yeah. But he had been on a tour of Bangladesh with them previously. Yeah. All right. Um... So two test matches and then that's done. Yeah. I, I'm more... I, so I, I think New Zealand do have a chance, especially because I think... I think we've seen that oh, uh, in the pandemic era, uh, you can get weird results in first test of series because the home sides aren't that well prepared either. Well, so, like England beating exactly, India out there. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Or West Indies beating England uh, in, in 2020. Um, so I think you... New Zealand could could draw that series one all. I wouldn't be that surprised. But then you're almost like, does that have an asterisk next to it? Because India didn't have half their team. I don't know. And then and then is that achievement valued as highly as it ought to be? I don't know. Um, but it's just a shame that literally the biggest series in the world, the number one in the team, number one team in the world going away to number two should objectively be the biggest test series. And it's just an, it's it's not far from non-event. Hopefully, like the T Twenty World Cup to degree, the cricket saves us. But um, we're kind of <laughs> relying quite a lot on freakish performances to keep interest levels up. Um, Has cricket never saved you. Uh, I, I don't think so. No, no. no. Oh, That'd be a good uh, magazine feature, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Saved by cricket. It'd be quite a thin issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, change your pace a little bit, Phil. What's your moment of the week? Well, it has to be. The story coming out of Essex, the resignation of their chairman, John Farragher, who's been in charge for a few years, but no more. Uh, historic allegation of a racist comment made in a board meeting from 2017. Um, the Essex board unanimously accepted his resignation and he departed the club with immediate effect at the end of last week. He denies and it's worth obviously necessary legally. He denies strenuously ever having said um, this this line. Um, nonetheless, he's no longer a part of the club. John Stevenson is the impressive new CEO. Of course, he has a long and impressive CV. He worked at Lords for the MCC for many many years. He ran Lords in effect um, as the MCC's boss there. Uh, he's obviously a club legend, former England opening bat as well. So he's a good man for the club to have at the moment, I would say, and they probably need him because it's been a, a peculiarly rudderless setup there for a little while. John Farragher was simultaneously chairman and chief executive for much of last summer until Stevenson stepped in. And the statement is a strong one and a good one by Stevenson. Uh, in contrast, I suppose, to some of the more mealy-mouthed uh, half statements, if you like, that have, that have come out from Yorkshire and so on. Um, of course, there is no space anymore to prevaricate or to obfuscate or anything like that. You have to now be addressing these problems head on um, because, as we know, this is an existential issue for the game. And he said, 
important first step, but the club must now act further. Our internal reporting mechanisms will be reviewed to ensure such matters like this are dealt with appropriately and immediately. I intend for these next actions to be, to be communicated as clear as possible. Um, there is a, another element to this, you know, dispiriting story that the story goes, and this is not proved yet, but the there is a there is a suggestion, a strong suggestion that the ECB uh, somebody went to the ECB with these complaints in 2018, and the ECB didn't act on those uh, allegations. This was as reported years. by Lizzie Ammon in the Times, wasn't it? You yeah. yeah, yeah. Now uh, the ECB have now said themselves that we are looking in to this allegation internally to find out what happened if indeed anything did happen back in 2018 but if it transpires that uh, an investigation was ignored um, back in 2018 then that that is perhaps even more dispiriting than just than another story of one individual um, because it does speak of a of a you know a code of silence um, in the last two years, I genuinely be believe that the ECB has undertaken its own awakening with issues around race and cricket. I genuinely do believe that for what it's worth. And I don't think that everything is... Um, I don't think this is a sport that's gone backwards. I have to say that. I think that the sport was backwards for forever until very recently. Cricket has accidentally found itself in the vanguard now, I think, of an of a, of a important moment for British life. And I think that the ECB belatedly and you can underline that word, they are confronting um, these issues. But 2018 is three and a half years ago, and it would be interesting to see what comes out regarding this, you know, because if, if, that, if that allegation was put to them and they ignored it, uh, and of course Essex appeared to have ignored it as well, you know, then that's, that tells you how, much far, how far we still have to go and how far uh, this story still has to run. And that's not the only allegation no, no, of no, racism of at Essex. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so two days later, former player Zoeb Sharif, um, who played for Essex for a couple of years around the turn of the century, 20, uh, 2001 to 2003, and then moved on to Sussex for a few games. Uh, he's alleged that he was, and the day after September the 11th, subjected to various uh, racial slurs passed off as banter, of course, that word that should be banned from the British, from the English vocabulary. Uh, and yeah, his story, of course, carries echoes all the way up north and then back again. And um, you just feel, as I've said on this show before, we're kidding ourselves if we think this, this was a, a Yorkshire based issue. And I've said that a number of times and um, the story related to, to Zoeb will be investigated again by Essex. And, you know, they're doing due diligence, opening up an internal investigation, doing what they have to do for sure. And I hope doing it sincerely, but there's going to be a lot of investigations opened in a lot of county cricket clubs over a long period of time. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's worth just reading out what Zoeb said to the to Mirror. He said, it was a day after the September 11 attacks. People started calling me bomber. I didn't say anything at the time. I was a teenager in a dressing room with big characters. To them, it was banter. To me, it wasn't. But you don't want to do anything to block your chance of getting into the first team. Um, there have been other developments of the Yorkshire case. And I'll run through them. But the DCMS hearing is tomorrow. So anything we say will age very quickly. Um, and will, of course, cover everything that emerges from the DCMS hearing on next week's show. Um, so today, the cricketer reported that Adil Rashid has confirmed that he heard Michael Vaughan question the number of players of Asian heritage in the Yorkshire side in 2009. Vaughan denies the allegations made by not only Adil Rashid, but Azim Rafiq and former Pakistan bowler Rana Naveed Al-Hassan. Um, Joe Root spoke to the press about the racism scandal at Yorkshire. He gave uh, a statement and then answered some questions from the press, um, to which Rafiq then seemingly tweeted in response to the statement saying, disappointed is not even the feeling, incredibly hurt, but uncomfortable truths are hard to accept. I'll just read out what Root said. 
it's obviously deeply, deeply hurtful that it's happened at the club that I'm so close to. It means so much for me to go and play for Yorkshire. In terms of my position, if you're not at the club, how can you make any change? How can you move things forward? As I said, I look forward to speaking to Lord Battelle at some point in the future about how, how I can help move things forward. That's my position on things and we'll see what happens in the future. The most important thing that we have to look at right now is how we move forward as a sport, how we move forward as a society as well. I think this is deeper than just cricket. I think we need to what we need to do is address what's happened and find ways of educating moving forward and really looking at the areas in which we as a sport and beyond that as well. It's really important we recognise what has happened and make sure that moving forward we never see this happen again. And whether it's Yorkshire, whether it's in club cricket, whether it's in the street or whatever, we've got to find a way of confronting this and stopping it and making sure that absolutely we are getting rid of racism from society. I think the bit that Rafiq is referring to in his tweet is that Root claimed to have never seen racism directly at his, during his time at the club. Um, as I said, we'll address all this in next week's show because everything's going to change or move forward at least for, uh, a lot in the next 24 hours. I just want to add Kamlesh Patel, who I've interviewed a couple of times. I don't know him well at all, um, but you could not ask for a better person to be in that in that seat at the moment um, uh, and if if Yorkshire are going to drag their way out of this in the end and if it's truly going to be a glasnost approach um, then he's the literally the best person that I, you could possibly imagine to be in in situ now there will be some carpers out there who will say well he's got friends at the ECB he's going to be compromised this is a bloke um, who lives and breathes Yorkshire cricket um, and who has dedicated himself to to public service. He's a trailblazer in terms of social care and health care. Um, he's a seriously, seriously impressive bloke. Um, and he speaks openly and with authority about uh, about race, but about class as well. He's spoken, spoken on the record about um, activating not just the British Asian communities, but also the white working classes that have been ignored from by, by cricket as well. He's a he's a intelligent bloke, and his his heart is with the game. And look, we wait and see. But I don't think he will in, he will allow himself to be compromised or complicit in any kind of cover up whatsoever. Yeah, I think I think if people um, are particularly invested in the story and are interested to in see how it move forward, I'd highly recommend the press conference that Lord Patel gave uh, after he was appointed to the role. It's about half an hour long, and if you can find it online, he, he comes across. Very well. He does. And, and, and also, confronts so, sorry, yes. the difficult questions well. Yeah, there's also um, a Radio 4 profile that ran this weekend. So if you want to know a little bit more about his background, the um, the positive things that he's done um, and the kind of character that is now right in the eye of this this terrible storm, then it's well worth listening to. Mm, absolutely. Um, again, another gear change. Joe, what's your moment of the week? <laughs> yeah, um, serious gear change. Um so, yeah, uh, Izzy Wong is playing for Sydney Thunder in the Moon's Big Bash out in Australia. Um, this is the 19-year-old England, well, soon-to-be England fast bowler, um, having her first experience outside of kind of county cricket or the 100. Um, and she's made a really exciting start. She's a hugely exciting cricketer, mainly known for being like a fast bowler, a genuine fast bowler, which England have been looking for, particularly with Catherine Brunt can't go on forever, although she seemingly might do. She um, literally can. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, against Adelaide Strikers last Tuesday, uh, she took the new ball bowl three overs for eight runs, then got uh, shifted up the order to number five and smashed 43 off 17 balls, 36 of those coming from six sixes. Did you know she was a batter? I knew she could whack it, but I think she's improved a lot. So when I spoke to her coach a couple of years ago, he, he definitely said there was potential there, yeah. but it's not really been seen. Um, and she's not, I don't think she's batted since. Um, which Yeah, she, so that's the only time she's batted in her last six games. But she's. I think. I think it's more because they haven't lost that many wickets. I think she's down at six or seven. Okay. But uh, that's the, the player England have been crying out for, isn't it? Mm. That sort of hitter at six or seven to change a white ball cricket match. Yeah. Absolutely, and you know, th there's not enough evidence to suggest that she'll be able to go and just do it for England. But this is a this is good quality cricket out there. And it was clean. It wasn't yeah. you know fancy. It close your eyes and launch a couple over mid wicket. That you know they were they were proper hits. Mm. Yeah. Real hits. And there were, there were, yeah, there were signs of it in the hundred. She had a, a couple of couple of big hits in there. So there's definitely a lot of promise there. 
Then yesterday in the Sydney Derby, each took two for 27 and a victory over the Sixers. Uh, Alyssa Healy and Ash Gardner, two good scouts to get. And the second one in, in consecutive balls as well. And the second one to get Gardner was an absolute jaffer, kind of angling in at the right hand and then moving away and taking off stump. Um, and yeah, she was named player of the match for that performance. And obviously there's a very good chance she will be out in Australia again this winter with with the England side who um, I'm told England are going to name the Ashes squad on or around the 15th of December. Uh, that obviously gets going uh, in the new year. Uh, I'd be amazed if she's not in the squad and there's every chance she'll she'll get a game, particularly in the um, in the shorter stuff, I think. Mm. Um, should we talk about the Ashes? Yeah. Um, so, Aussie selector George Bailey earlier this week... Rolling along. Hey? Doesn't matter. It's a um, reference to an old film that you probably haven't seen. No, yeah. I have no it's idea. It's a wonderful what... world. I've not seen it. I've heard of it, but wonderful life. Yeah. It's a wonderful life. <laughs> Forget it. Um Aussie selector George Bailey appeared to confirm that Mark Harris long. would open the batting for Australia in the ashes. Uh he said that last week, but he ever so slightly backtracked on those comments when speaking to the grey cricketer guys early today. Um Harris averages 23 in Test cricket and has had a mixed start to this year's Sheffield Shield. Uh, also on Ashes watch, Usman Khawaja is the leading run scorer in the Shield at the time of recording. Ian Chappell said a couple of weeks ago, I think everyone knows that Usman Khawaja can make hundreds against that standard of bowling, but I'm not convinced that he's going to make it against an England attack, which in a way is a, is a compliment to the England attack. Um, we'll, we'll take them when we can get them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not sure that's exactly what he meant, but yeah. sure. <laughs> and, then, and then Kawaja responded uh, something, saying something along the lines of, uh, Chapel, you're not, you're not even the best player in your own family. Pulled a Jimmy um, Ormond. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy yeah. Ormond sledge. Good to see that um, one still going. Kawaja could be an option to bat at five or six. None of those guys are definitely nailed, nailed in. And it has been basically a year since Australia last played. So, interesting to see how they go. How's Cameron Green got on so far, do you know? Uh, I think he scored... Uh, let me just check this. Let me tee you up again. I think he scored 100 and hasn't got a wicket. Oh, yeah, I can't see him bowling much in the Ashes, even if he plays five games, really. Yeah. Might not need to. No, no, indeed. <laughs> that's kind of what I'm saying, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's interesting that Harris has got the, got the nod, even if it's been kind of slightly... Uh, taken back I mean from an English perspective you take it <laughs> yeah well I would much rather be bowling at Harris than Kawaja I mean Kawaja's got a good record at, in home tests particularly average 14 test cricket yeah I've always thought the handling of him is slight, slightly odd mm. I, know, I know he goes in and out of form a little bit but he's a good player at a time when they haven't got that many top quality batsmen yeah um, and far, I mean five would you'd think would be a bit low for him. I'm, where's he batting in shield cricket in top three? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Double check that. Um, Let's stop asking you questions. I haven't been watching much of the shield, guys. Um, Kuwaja has been batting at... Four. Um, Phil, you want to know how Cameron Green's doing. He's averaging 42 after four games, 100, 250s, and he's got five wickets at 50 with quite a high economy rate as well. But he's gone in there and he's he's made enough runs to, to keep his spot. Already pretty much securing. Yeah. He's just below Sean Marsh in the Western Australia batting averages. Right. Um, I wonder if uh, Mitch Marsh is in the conversation as well. Obviously, you know, two Ashes hundreds against England last time out. Um, very different format, but he's he's a player mm. in form, seemingly kind of peaking in his international career. Whether you could play him at five, basically just as a as a batter, uh, with might bowl a few overs, kind of share that role with with Green. That might be quite tempting. What having Green and Marsh at five and six, possibly. Mm. Yeah, I, I think there might be something in that. Uh, it would mean that you'd have five right-handers in a row. In fact, and then the tail as well with Cummins at eight. So you'd have six in a row, which wouldn't be ideal on paper. I guess Travis Head would be your normal number five in that in that selection. But I can see that. And Mitch Marsh is a bit of a streaky player. He's got a great record against England, as you say, but home and away against England with ball as well. I think mean, he averages 26 with the ball. Ben was saying this the other yeah, day. Yeah, 45 with the bat, 26 with the ball. Yeah, but his career just... average is basically 
not far off the opposite. <laughs> this is it. He's the sobers of Ashes cricket and wouldn't be surprised, obviously on the back of how he's feeling now, wouldn't be surprised if he if he gets the nod. There's definitely just a lot of energy for him, isn't there? And as you get in the lead up to Ashes series, there are cricketers that are suddenly identified as, you know, that, that this could be, he could have a special series. A bit like we were doing with Livingston, which obviously came to nothing. But there, there seems a kind of a, a, a comparison to be made there, apart from the fact that Marsh has already got a couple of Ashes hundreds and yes, Livingston's barely got a Red Bull run for I two know, years. Li- li- living- <laughs> Livingston's uh, leggies were coming out all right. Who, sorry? Livingston's leggies were coming out all right. You know, yeah. Yeah. And the rest. Yeah. <laughs> and the rest. Um, there's, there's a, with, with James Pat- Pattinson's uh, retirement, there is, I guess, a little bit of a race to be the reserve quick or the quick who comes in when, when or if there's an injury to the, the main three guys. Um, Michael Neese has been in a lot of Australia squads in the last couple of years without playing a test match. Uh, he's got. He's only played two games. Uh, he's got three wickets at 37. Uh, Jai Richardson. He just had an injury scare as well, but they reckon he'll be fit for okay. the first Ashes Test if if required. Um, Jai Richardson, he's who, one for me. who who uh, did really well in Test debut a couple of years ago against Sri Lanka. He's got 16 wickets at 12 this year. This year, Oof. and uh, Mark Sacchetti has got 18 wickets at 15. He's been. Um, tipped for a possible spot. On the well, he was due, well. he was picked for the South Africa tour that never happened, wasn't he? So he's he's obviously very much mm. in the mix. Re- I think Richardson's really good. He really good. good. He's, he's, he's that, had really bad injury problems. He's got that snap. He reminds me a little bit of Gillespie, sort of tallish, thin, not much muscle on him at all. But he's got that kind of elasticity. I saw an early game live when I was out there years ago one of his early Big Bash games, and I was with an Aussie journalist at the time. I said, "Who the hell's this kid?" Because he was fizzing it past the face and clearing the keeper, you know. Um, and yeah, while whoever it is that comes in, if there is an injury, will have to make their mark. And England will see a little little glimpse of an option there, you know, so a, a player to particularly possibly attack. That said, he is class from what I've seen. Nisa has, as you say, been around the team for three or four years. He's, he, was, he was on this Ashes tour last time out, was very close to playing here. So you can imagine he'll come in there and he'll land it on a sixpence as well. So even if they do lose one of the big two, and I don't count Stark in that, one of the big two, then it's not like their, their, their potency is just going to fall away. Yeah, I'll be very surprised if Stark plays all five test matches. I was going to say the same. I mean, it, it, you could see based on, again, different formats, but he's not in great rhythm. Um, you could absolutely see him being being leapfrogged after one or two tests. Uh, you'd think he'd start the series, but um, but yeah, it seems like unfortunately they've got quite a lot of quite a lot of decent options. Um, and Joe, you were saying before we start recording that you know we're actually going to get some cricket in Australia quite soon. I think by the time we record next week's show, uh, the England versus England Lions match would have, would have started. Yeah, and these are these are big games for England, not just to get in rhythm, but to work out what their team is. Uh, particularly, you've got the kind of Hamid v Crawley question, which, I mean, by statistical measures over the last year or so, it should absolutely be Hamid. But there is that sense that they want to get Crawley in the side. So I, I think that really is a straight shootout. I feel like whoever gets the big score, if, if there is a big score, um, probably gets the nod there. Can I ask you if you could pick the player to get a big score? And the player to get a five for, who would you who would you like to see go oh, well? Good this question. Week? Pope uh, and Robinson. Joe, I would go Robinson with the ball, uh, and Pope. I was probably Stokes. Yeah, it's got to be Stokes they're, in terms of someone very, who can very very gentle with Ben Stokes, aren't they? Saying, look, he'll, he'll be back when he needs to be. He's already there. <laughs> yeah, so he, <laughs> it's, it's beyond implausible to think they're going to get to Gabber and Ben. I'm sorry, we're just going to keep working with you. Maybe Perth. <laughs> no, come on, come on, he's there. Uh, I've I've found uh, the so the, the players are currently going through their quarantine period at the moment, and they've they're, they're got nothing else to do, so they're being very active on the Instagram. Um, and Stuart Broad has kind of started this trend of asking his teammates to. Um, come up with a triangle of positivity to help them get through each day um, and seeing the stuff they come up with has been quite interesting but also content broad today uh, claimed on his Instagram that he accidentally brushed his teeth with sun cream which is pretty pretty rank so it's, it's all it's falling also totally implausible that you do that for more than half a second and then you taste it and then you 
Yeah, I'm, mm. I'm sure he didn't just keep going for two minutes <laughs> and they go, oh, this uh, tastes a bit off. Not if as minty as <laughs> I mean, this tour's falling to pieces pretty early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's... laughs> we normally but, at least get to the camera. Uh, excellent. Um, elsewhere, Stefani Taylor scored a brilliant 100 from number four to help West Indies chase down 226, having been 15 for three against Pakistan. She now averages 45 with the bat and less than 22 with the ball in ODI cricket and now sits she's third on the all-time run scorers list. She's going to end up with a record that's going to eclipse everyone, isn't she? Uh, I think in ODI, ODI cricket, in ODI cricket, yeah. yeah, it stands up with the very yeah. best. I mean, Which we, is we, the premier cricket. In yeah, it is interesting comparing her to Perry uh, because Perry is, you know, the, the goat, the one who everyone talks about. But if you look at their ODI records, it's it's not, not a million miles off. Um Perry averages a bit more of the bat and a bit more of the ball. I mean, it's not, not a huge amount separating the two of them. Um, anyway, I think that is all we have time for. Cheers, Phil. Cheers, Joe. Uh, this has been the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast in association with Charles Tirrett. Please remember to use the code WISDOM20 at checkout.